Hello and a very warm welcome to Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. Now, with uh, major problems like the financial crisis, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and global warming all requiring international cooperation, we have with us in the studio today somebody who's a specialist in the field, a commentator on relations between the United States and Europe and specifically Germany. And she is DWTV's own Melinda Crane. Melinda, lovely to have you here today. Nice to be here. Melinda, you've been based here in Germany for about two decades now. It's my feeling that the country has changed immensely in that period of time. Is that how you see it? And if that is the case, what have those changes been? It has changed immensely. I've been in Berlin 10 years, and just Berlin, even visually, you know, you drive through the city and you don't recognize places that you've been driving past every day because the city is in constant change, which, by the way, is something I love about it and which reminds me very much of other cities I love, like New York. It has that kind of dynamism. Mm. What has changed about Germany in general? Um, certainly, the country is more questioning than it was when I came here. I came here in the early 80s. It's unbelievable, <laughs> that long ago. There was a certain complacency at that time. Um, Germans were rightfully very proud of their economy. The economy was mostly doing well. Um, and I think there was a sense here that Germany's model, its economic model, was solid, built to last. Some of that, of course, has been challenged by the economic crisis and by the difficulties that the country has had also with unification. Of course, Unification, one of the biggest changes that Germany has been through. I had the immense privilege to report on that intensively mm -hmm. and to see what that meant for West as well as East Germans. That, of course, has changed Germans' idea also of who they are. I would say it's opened the country up in very exciting ways, but it's also been a huge challenge. <laughs> Melinda, we were just laughing about you and your, uh, your love of uh, cakes, uh, German and American. Let's talk about something, though, that you were saying in the middle of that report, that when you see yourself in your young days as a sort of a cub reporter almost out there, you feel a sense of melancholy. Well, yeah, and nostalgia. Those were fantastic years. I reported all over Europe. You know, I came here, I'd, I'd been in my life to France, England, and Mexico, and that was the extent of my international experience. Well, and yeah, Africa during my PhD work. But I came here, and a whole continent opened up for me. And those were incredibly interesting years. As you saw there, I was uh, in the Balkan when the war broke out between Serbia and Croatia. I was pregnant with uh, my second child and traveling all over to cover that story. Really fantastic. And there were, there were reports that we did where I really had the feeling we've done We've done good here. The Chernobyl children who came to Germany uh, for treatment because they had leukemia, we got huge contributions after that. And uh, we got letters from the hospital saying we were able to treat a lot more children because of what you did. Mm -hmm. That is so rewarding as a journalist. Okay, these days you work in the main at Deutsche Welle, DWTV. Let's just talk about Deutsche Welle a wee little bit. Does, is there an approach that Deutsche Welle has to news and current affairs that you could describe as specifically German or European, perhaps? I'm so glad you asked that because we ask ourselves so often here, what is our niche? What is the unique thing that Deutsche Welle can do? And for me, it's not broadcasting to Germans abroad. That's too limited. It's about a certain way of seeing the world. You could call it German, you could call it Central European. It's a way of seeing the world that involves some social democratic aspects, um, an interest in the way that it, cultures interact together, so an intercultural approach. I think we have an incredible strength in that area. It's, we don't take an Anglo-Saxon point of view. I'm sure you would say the same for yourself, even though we are from the Anglo-Saxon culture, and that surely infuses the way that we work. But when you live here for two decades, of course, 
you begin to see things in a different way, and I think that's an important viewpoint. Let's talk about this Anglo- Anglo-Saxon thing, because certainly in the U.S., where you come from, there's, news has drifted a little bit closer towards opinion in recent years, in the past decade or so. And Germany, meanwhile, still subscribes pretty much to what is viewed often as an old-fashioned notion of unbiased news. Yeah. A problem, I think. I teach a course for the Deutsche Welle Academy in intercultural moderation, and we're often asked by the students, these are students in Egypt, in Syria, um, what are the qualities of a good journalist? What do you have to be able to do? And they often believe that they're supposed to be neutral and objective, and we tell them that is impossible. All of us has, has a point, every one of us has a point of view, every one of us has a perspective. The point is to look for balance, to try to present different points of view, to try to get a, dia- a dialogue going. And I think you can never claim to be objective. We used to have that idea in the U.S. as well, that the presenter, especially the anchor person, is sort of, you know, the omniscient uncle who knows everything and is perfectly neutral. Well, that's a fiction, of course. But what he can do is he can be biased. He can try to get both sides of a question, try to get different points of view, and hope that the truth will come out through a clash of differing opinions. Okay, let's talk about the... the, That's the backdrop to making news. Let's talk about one news personality, President Obama, Barack Obama. I know you've you've been around Clinton, you've interviewed Bush Jr. I know you'd very much like to interview President Obama. There was euphoria surrounding Obama, here in Berlin specifically, as a candidate, now he's in office, he's making demands on Europe, he's making tough calls. Is that euphoria going to wane now? It already is waning. It's waning in the U.S. because people are terribly worried about the economic situation and no amount of Nobel Prizes or acclamation abroad uh, distracts them from the fact that what they're looking for is jobs and they don't have them. And for that reason, they're also very skeptical about what he's doing in Afghanistan. And to some extent, it's waning here. Um, we are seeing him in these at, at this time going to Oslo to get his Nobel Prize, but as a war president, and of course, a lot of people, especially here in Germany with its sensitivity on martial issues, say, is this really justified? Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the fact that he's not going to be delivering very much in Copenhagen in terms of climate change. He will go there, but he's going there more or less with empty hands. Let's wait and see. Well, as we've already heard uh, before Melinda came into journalism, she worked in the field of development aid, but she was left uh, dismayed and disillusioned by much of what she saw. Hopefully that's not the case for the thousands of young Germans who who as part of a new government program are being sent out to offer what they can in developing countries, but just as importantly, to learn what they can. Ariana Guchka is not a teacher and hasn't had any previous experience with children. But she's here at this Mexican orphanage to help those who have had a rough start in life, in stark comparison to her own life in Germany. It's a huge challenge for the German volunteer. She's got to cope with children like little Moises, not to mention trying to understand a foreign language. In the morning or after school, it's hard work. The children are tired and some of them don't want to eat anything. They fall asleep at the table. We have to force them to eat. It's really difficult. Ariana was one of the first volunteers since 2008 to take part in a German government program called Weltwärts, or Worldwoods. What makes this program special is that the Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development picks up the whole tab for travel, accommodation, insurance and a little spending money. Competition for placements is tough. Ariana won through with her openness and her clear aims. Learning the language, acquiring a greater understanding of other cultures. By seeing the way people live here, I've learned to appreciate how lucky I am. I've realized that there are so many people who have so much less than we do, but who still have a smile on their face every day and make the best of every day. It's a struggle for the orphanage where Ariana works. It has to fund itself entirely from donations. And although Mexico is the world's fifth largest oil producer, almost one in every three children there lives in poverty. Many parents are unable to provide for their children and bring them here. 
La Casa del Sol funciona 24 We work around the clock all year round. We have full-time staff, but not many. It's only enough to provide the children with the absolute minimum. The volunteers are important because apart from all the normal jobs they do, they give the children love and affection. And that's something our permanent staff don't have time to do. Moises was brought to the Casa del Sol six months before Ariano arrived. And thanks to the special attention she gives him, he started laughing again. I think I'm helping out here because I've simply got more time to give the children a hug now and again, to give them a cuddle. The staff don't have a chance to do this, and I can give them a sense of security that they aren't otherwise used to. Ariana also lives at the Casa del Sol, just here, behind the laundry. Not what she's used to, but all part of the experience. She shares a small room with a colleague. Photos remind her of Germany. A youngster back home, she's been forced to grow up a bit in Mexico. It's a modest lifestyle here, but I'm happy. I don't mind sharing a room. I don't mind sharing a toilet with four girls. It's all completely fine. Thanks to the Weltbeds program, Ariana Guchka now has first-hand experience of a new culture. She's one of nearly 6,000 young volunteers to complete their placement or who are currently involved in one. The initiative hopes to equip them with invaluable insights for their future roles in a globalized world. Well, Melinda and I were just agreeing that that's a pretty good project for our teenage children. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. My daughter did something very like that last summer, briefly, in Malawi, and she's eager to do it again. And I must say, this is different from the kind of development assistance that I worked on when Pin I was doing down. my PhD. Pin it down. What's the difference? Well, this is humanitarian assistance, and you're really, uh, you're addressing basic needs. And, uh, you know, you said it yourself when we were chatting just now, you don't go there saying... Uh, this is what I know and I'm going to tell them, you're a part of a learning experience. You go there with much more humility. And this was one of the things that bothered me when I was working on development assistance. I initially started writing about that field thinking I would like to work in this area. My father was born in Africa. My family had long ties to Africa and I, I went there to do research. But I was appalled by the fact that many of the experts working on those projects, um, not only did they seem to think they knew everything, but they were determined to perpetuate their own jobs there. They were not interested in making themselves obsolete. They were not interested in promoting the country's independence, but really in promoting their own very pleasant way of life there. And that sounds terribly cynical. Mm -hmm. And development aid has changed some since then. But the fact is that a lot of development aid actually only reinforces dependency. Okay, that's the, that's the academic take on it. That's the analytic take, uh, and it's all very interesting and worthy. I'd like to hear a little bit more from, from uh, Melinda Crane, the person. You came, after all, from a very well-off, or a well-off background in the northeast of the United States. Tell me what your impressions were when, as a youngster, you, had, you were for the first time confronted with third-world poverty. It was mind-boggling for me. I had been to Mexico. I had seen some poverty but nothing like what I saw in Africa. One small anecdote, I, I was writing about mining projects that were often way out in the jungle. So, and the countries that I wrote about were the poorest in Africa at the time because they had the largest UNDP, UN Development uh, Program funds. So one time we were in Ghana and we were way off in the jungle going to one of these projects. And when we got there, there was quite a bit of hectic. Uh, I was staying in a guest house. There was nobody else around. I must say it was quite dirty. The only thing you heard all night long was monkeys chattering. And um, there was a lot of scrambling. And then they served me a dinner. And it was a funny kind of a dinner. And um, But I, I ate it. And I w went to bed and didn't think anymore. And when I got up the next morning, I was told, you know, we're very sorry, but we don't have any breakfast for you. And I said, oh, why not? And they said, well, actually, all the food that we had, we served you last night for dinner, there's nothing left. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, I assume they had given me the food that they would have been eating themselves because there was nothing. There was nothing in the markets. Ghana was famous for, famous for markets. They had nothing to sell. You know, this was devastating to me. And 
I often toyed with the idea of staying and trying to do good work there. And humanitarian aid, I think, to come back to the report we saw, does help to meet people's basic needs. But the projects that I worked on did not. Mm. Well, we've been talking about uh, Melinda in Africa here, Melinda in Mexico. <clears throat> she now lives here in Germany. And I, I read the, when I was researching for the program on my colleague, Melinda, uh, that one reason why she found Germany so fascinating when she arrived here in the first place was the how the country has come to terms with its history. That's interesting stuff, I think. And when it comes to talking about history, one of the hottest topics of debate here in Berlin in recent years has been whether or not to rebuild the former Hohenzollern Palace in the heart of the city. The original Prussian edifice was badly destroyed in the Second World War and then fully torn down by the communist authorities in East Germany. So, to rebuild or not to rebuild? I must confess I have strong uh, views on this, Melinda. I know you have. You're the guest. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I wouldn't have wanted it to be rebuilt. Um, I, I'm really impressed by Germany's ability to deal with its scars. I find it deeply moving that this country constantly re-engages with its past. Nobody has done a better job of looking at the terrible wounds of the Holocaust and of the Second World War than the Germans. But, and, but, and, gonna, there's a yeah, but, but coming. <laughs> but, you know, I want to see scars. I want to see the yeah. past. And this, this castle that they are going to rebuild, this palace, this is Disneyland. This but is they, like they a could film rebuild set. It, they could rebuild it and put the scars in it. Well, they could put the iron in it or the his historical commentary in the building as well. Yeah, they could have left what was there, which was an important scar. We saw it in the report. It's a hole, the, it's the, a vacuum the, in the middle no, of the, the city. No, the palace of the, of, of the Republic that had been built by the communist government. And they had in the middle of it the balcony from which Karl Liebknecht had read out the proclamation of the Weimar Republic. This is interesting stuff. These are the kind of scars I want to see. You I don't want to preserve this building that had no architectural integrity for 200 years yep. in the heart of Berlin because yep. of whatever events took place in and around it. Yeah, I want a city that reflects its past. That's what I love about this city. And I think, you know, I understand that from a, the point of view of, of city planning, you need to have density there. I don't like this field that's there at the moment. Mm. So we need to have something there, but I wouldn't necessarily have wanted this kind of a reconstruction. A quick take, is it always wrong to rebuild history? No, and I actually find the Dresden, the, the famous Church of Our Lady, a more successful example, but we did have the stones of the church in Dresden at that spot mm -hmm. for all these years. There's more continuity for me there than there is in the case of the Stadtschloss. Okay, we're talking about Berlin. What I would like to ask you to do is to follow in the footsteps of uh, US President, President Kennedy, who once said that he was a Berliner. You too are a Berliner, Mel Melinda, after all these years in the city. Give me a pithy definition of the typical Berliner. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who likes to talk, so in that way I'm probably a, <laughs> a classic example. Berliners like to talk, they don't mince their words, they have a word for it, Berliner Schnauze, yeah, exactly. and, uh, and somebody who has a good sense of humour, I think. Okay. They're a cheeky lot. Um, not much time to go, Melinda. Uh, we're going to have to finish a roundup now with the Talking Germany quick quiz, yeah, in Berliner style. I want quick answers to my quick questions. We're going to begin with uh, politicians. Who's your favourite, Hillary Clinton or Angela Merkel? Angela Merkel. Oh, interesting. What do you want to, uh, from your news, Melinda? More fact or more opinion? Oh, Peter, I want both. I want both, but separate. Good facts, good opinion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, would you rather be an architect or a development worker? Huh. <laughs> development worker. Who are you going to cheer for if Germany play the US at the Soccer World Cup? <laughs> <laughs> Germany. Good one. Would you prefer being a talk show host or a talk show guest? Host. Ah, <laughs> I'll come on your show. Um, what, who makes the better cake, the Americans or the Germans? Oh, Germans. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for today. Our very own Melinda Crane has been here on the show. She's a cookie eater and a conversationalist. I'm sure you've seen. If you've enjoyed her company as much as I have, do come back next week. Just.